got another one of them. Popping at the mouth or the side of his neck when he pouts. No argument, no rebuttal from. He ain't from my town. I don't know him, so I'm guessing he's a clown. Welcome to Three Count Commentaries. This is your boy, Mongo Slade. We're going to talk about AEW Dynamite from May the 19th, 2021. So, first match, Christian Cage versus Matt Seidel. Pretty solid. No real baby face or heel. It was just an exercise and good match. I mean, that was pretty much what it was. Good match. And so then after the match, uh, Christian obviously won. Uh, Taz told Christian he's going to pay. One we'll make you pay. You're going to pay very soon. You're going to pay if you want to pay very soon. And then out strutted Ricky Starks. Sans neck brace, but it was pretty clear from this whole segment how this the weirdness of all of this that he is not well. So Ricky Starts came out and said that he's his own man, and that he don't sit on the sideline with the flunkies. He's going to go out here handle some business. And then uh, Team Taz jumps Cage and Seidel from behind, beat him down, beat him, beat him down. Then Hangman Page comes out with his drink in hand. He then hands the drink to Ricky Starks, goes in there, starts to fight. And he, uh, he ends up getting powerbombed by Brian Cage. So, uh, Ricky Starks was not touched and he didn't touch anybody. So, clearly he's injured. Um, I, I was still holding out some hope that maybe he wasn't down too bad. But uh, they're they pretty much going to use him as a mouthpiece now. So, okay, cool. Um what do I think about this? I think nothing about this. I don't understand why Christian is feuding with Taz. I mean, I know why they're feuding. I know the I know the reason they're feuding. What I'm saying is, who cares? This was your big signing, your game changer for AEW, and you're selling a pay per view. Why not put Christian versus Kenny Omega on your pay per view? What, what what's the reason not to do it? Oh, it's too soon. So, shall I, <laughs> when you, you sign legends, they skip the line sometimes. I mean, it is what it is. Um, throwing Christian in a battle royal, ah, even the, even I saw a lot of AEW, you know, marks. Even they were upset about that. It makes no sense to throw him in the battle royal. He's a big star. This is not the Royal Rumble. And then, like, so you know, you could have done Omega versus Christian in a big match. And, you know, did something good. And then could have had maybe Pac versus uh, Orange Cassidy on that show and had that to be a number one contenders match or something like that. But, hey, I don't, I'm not Booker of the Year. So, I don't know what to tell you. Um, I did read somewhere that uh, Tony Khan was thinking of building the third show, the second show, around the FTW title and making that an official title in AEW. Uh, in doing so, uh, okay, I don't, I don't know. Like, what is it? Like, it hasn't been, it's not relevant and it hasn't been relevant in a long time. So I don't see the benefit of it being a real title, but then again, if it is, because they're going to need titles, I guess, if they're going to have two separate shows, it's still, it's worthless because they have the, 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 we'll get there in a moment. Never mind. Okay. So we get uh let's 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 skip that. We'll come back to it. Uh Moxley and Eddie Kingston. Well, these two guys are joking about the acclaimed being rappers, talking about putting a dent in the tag team division, how they're getting up there in the rankings, you know, and then they started joking about super kick parties. And, you know, he's like, I don't get super kick parties, this Eddie Kingston. He's like, I don't get super kick parties. And then he's like, I don't throw super kicks, you don't throw super kicks. Do you have to throw super kicks to be invited to said party? And there was a hard cut in the middle of that promo. So apparently they just went on and on and on. <laughs> and at some point they just edited in that, you know, they're going to win the match or whatever. Whatever, man. <laughs> so the acclaimed, uh, which is Anthony Bowens, who never talks. Now he cuts a promo. He called John Moxley lunatic cringe, which is something I saw on the Internet in like 2015. It's I'm not saying it is wrong. Saying it's not original. Um, then he said that this is their tag team division and that they got to go through them. And that was a mic drop. So mic drop in with mic drop in. 
So following that, Eddie Kingston and John Moxley, who were ranked number four, defeated the acclaimed, who were ranked number three. And during the rap intro, the the kid Max Caster says that Moxley and Kingston exchanged Valentine's Day gifts. He then said Moxley's wife is trying to get him for some oral sessions. And then he's called Eddie Kingston and said he looked like a box of Newports. Now, here's the thing about the oral sessions joke. It was good. I legit laughed. And I was part of the, oh, that was a legit one. That one came from the gut. Ooh. You know, that was a good battle rap line. And then he tried to back off of it. Like, oh, what are, she's just trying to get me on the podcast. What do you mean? It's like, you said it, you meant it. You said it, you meant He even did the hand signal with the, with the, with the head bob. You know, obviously all of this stuff had to be, you know, okay from the beginning. But he shouldn't have backed off of it. When, when they started reacting, you should have just been like, oh, well, take it how you want it. You knew it was coming. I mean, she named her show Oral Sessions. She, that's the point. That's the joke. We all, everybody did the same thing when she, when she named that goddamn show Oral Sessions. Come on. We're not children. You don't like, what does that mean? You're like, what the fuck do you mean? That's what does that mean? What do you think it means? <laughs> so obviously John Moxley was pretty upset about this whole Max Caster wanting to get a blowjob from his wife thing. He kicked his ass, rightfully so. Uh, there was some uh, acclaimed cheating, which I uh, always appreciate from the heels. Uh, Bowens tried to use the chain. Max Caster tossed him the chain. Referee saw it, grabbed Bowens, grabbed the chain. While the referee was distracted, Caster grabbed the boom box. And then John Moxley cut him off, then hit him with the boom box. And then the match somehow continued. Well, anyway, it went for a uh, wheelbarrow DDT. Which I liked. I liked that finish. The wheelbarrow into the... It's supposed to be a paradigm shift, but it looked more like a regular DDT. And um, that was it. And that was cool. That was not bad. You know, not the match itself, but the finish was it was fine. Um, the acclaimed are... They are who they are. I, I don't have anything against them. I don't have anything for them. They just are who they are, you know? Um, so let's back up a little bit. Because now we got to talk about everything involving Eddie Kingston and John Moxley. So the Varsity Blondes, who now have a new member named Julia Hart, who has joined the team. She actually uh, is, I think, an NCAA champion in something or other. I don't know what, though. I didn't pay that much attention to her, but she's, like, really small and cute or whatever. So Brian Pillman Jr. cuts the promo that says that, you know, um, them mentioning his dad and... Because most people would think that he's the reason why he got into wrestling. But he said, no, his dad is the reason he stayed away from wrestling. Because all his life, he's only known the dark side of the ring. But men like the Young Bucks essentially inspired him. Showed him that he can be a good man and chase his dreams. Then create a wrestler, Griff Garrison. Uh, who <laughs> Every time I say the name Griff Garrison, I just imagine him standing there like... Like in WWF attitude, like swinging back and forth with like with chop hands. It's just, <laughs> just nothing about this guy stands out at all. Except, you know, the, the hair. That was about it, man. He just comes across as the most creative wrestler guy ever. Just the most jobberish looking dude of all time. But um so he says that he used to run the gimmick table. Well, he used to run the merch table for the young bucks. He did it for them. And he says that while he was there, he just used to pick their brains and try to learn from them. And he said, they aren't the same guys anymore. And they, they need a reality check. And so, you know, that that's just is what it is. Uh, them trying to paint the Young Bucks as being inspirations. I, I don't know. I don't know about that one, dog. I'm guessing they do inspire some people. But are we supposed to think like, I, I don't know. These guys are young, so maybe. Maybe, maybe, maybe the Young Bucks are. So let's talk about that main event. Uh, Varsity Blinds versus the Young Bucks for the AEW World title. So one of them Bucks came out there in a fuzzy headband, which he gave to Michael Nakazawa. Uh, and I instantly, I was like, okay, now I can appreciate what they're trying to do. And I like Brian Pillman Jr. I do. I think most people do. 
But they're not credible main event guys, the Varsity Blondes. They're not credible main event guys. AEW has a thing with putting non-credible main event guys in, in at the main event spot, which is fine, I suppose, because you are trying to make new stars and all that kind of stuff, but you don't make new stars just by throwing randos in the main event. Just because Damian Demento was in the main event of Raw doesn't mean he's a main event guy, okay? He was just a guy who was in the main event of Raw. Like that Preston, was, was his name? Was it was his name Preston Vance, the ten guy, not that ten guy, the other ten guy from the from the Dark Order. He hasn't been on the show since he main evented the show, right? Is he a main event guy? No. Then why the hell was he in the main event? Come on, man. Anyway, um, Young Bucks are main event guys. Either by the way, uh, there was a spot in this match where one buck walked, dog walked the other one while he was on the top rope, like. If you want to impress me, walk that top rope without holding hands. Like, you're a skinny guy. You're not like some big, you know, Bam Bam Bigelow kind of guy, you know. Um, we know you can walk the top rope, Buck. And he just wanted to do a foot stomp from the top. It just, it was just nonsense. You know, they gave uh, the Varsity Blinds some spots where, you know, they let him get the upper hand. Obviously, they did the old baby face uh, when the, you know, they get they, they have to get cut off. So, um, that was fine. And then I really kind of lost interest uh, during this match. And uh, I, I started seeing aerosol cans again. And I'm like, is, is this like some Rick Martell arrogance shit? And we don't know nothing about it. Like, is it about to have like a Young Bucks cologne? Because that don't sound good. That don't sound good at all. That don't sound tight, my <laughs> my dude. <laughs> they don't sound tight. You want to have elite cologne? I guess you might, I guess if, if, if Mark buy it. They'll sell it. Um, but people started getting sprayed in the face. You know, Brian Pillman Jr. got sprayed in the face. Julia Hart got sprayed in the face. The referee took the goddamn aerosol can, and then somebody threw another one in the ring. I'm just like, what? And why are we doing aerosol cans? Like, how does that fit the gimmick? I don't get it. I, I, don't, I don't get it. In any event, I did like the finish, though. I believe it was Matt Jackson who had Brian Pillman Jr. in... The sharpshooter, and he was trying to crawl to the ropes, and the other buck did a slingshot over the top rope into a face buster while he was still in the sharpshooter. Um, I think they should have done a that knocked him out, and then the referee stopped the match more than him, you know, bouncing his head off the mat and then tapping out, which you know, it was still all right, I guess. Um, so following that that mess, Eddie Kingston and John Moxley comes out to beat up the young bucks. Because now they're the number one contenders, even though technically I don't see how, because they were the number they were the number four contenders when going into the show. How do you become the number one contenders? Oh well, I guess all the other contenders lost. In any event, um, so you had uh, these guys come in and they beat up the young bucks and choked them out. So they beat up the young bucks, they choked them out, and then Eddie Kingston started stealing their shoes. Which is a callback. They're even doing callbacks for jokes now. It's like, do you remember on the March 22nd Dynamite where they were talking about stealing shoes? Oh my God. Now they're stealing shoes. I love the long form storytelling in AEW. They don't forget anything, man. He's just stealing shoes, man. Remember he joked about stealing shoes, man. I was like, I don't see why Eddie Kingston is a clown all of a sudden. Like, what happened to the to the to the streetwise tough guy that we had? That's the guy we liked. As soon as he turns babyface, him and Moxley are, are cutting jokes now. See how that works? If WWE would have done something like that, we already know how that would have went, right? The two guys, the two edgiest guys on the roster. You know, who could have been tough talking street dudes. Now they're cutting jokes about super kick parties and they're collecting shoes. Why? Can anybody explain why that happened? No, no, no reason. I get it that they're best buds. They can even make inside jokes with each other and stuff like that. That could be cool. But they should have a harder edge when dealing with other people. Because that's really what got them over. That's what everybody liked about Eddie Kingston. Everybody liked Eddie Kingston because he was a legit real 
street dude who spoke from the heart, who when he said something, he meant it. But now since he's been palling around with John Moxley, Moxley does most of the talking. You know, he's been pushed forward as the alpha uh, friend. You know, and Kingston is kind of the, you know, he makes jokes. He's kind of the butt of the joke sometimes. You know, I, I just, I ain't feeling it. You know, the tag team was a great idea. The execution has been dog shit, though. I ain't going to hold you up. It's been dog shit. But, hey, you know, can't tell the booker of the year or nothing. So Chris Jericho was hanging out with Dean Malenko. And some announcer walked up to Jericho and says to Jericho, are we going to get your answer for the pinnacle tonight? And Jericho told him, like, shut up, Goober, go wait. I love this. This was great. Then uh, he said, you don't, you don't want to make, you don't want to upset the man with a thousand holds. And then the announcer guy slinks away. And Malenko says, you know, you know four more than me. And then Jericho was like, I forgot a few. <laughs> I, I love that. That was great. I, I legit like, you know, not just because, oh my God, it was a callback. It's because now Jericho is saying, maybe you are better than me. Because I, I don't know a thousand and four holes anymore. <laughs> So uh, let's talk about the Pinnacle and uh, the, the 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 other guys, the Inner Circle. Why why don't we? So uh, they're in a dinner, set the stage just like this this fine wine. This you got Wardlow guzzling wine from the bottle like an absolute barbarian, which doesn't fit his character. If we're being honest, he's supposed to be like this smooth, almost Batista like guy. He should be just as debonair as everyone else, but he's got like, he's like fucking uh, Homer in there. Not like, <clears throat> you know, like what the fuck? <laughs> you know, like, like, well, <laughs> what's the purpose of the man bun then? If we're going to be going that far. Anyway, they're in this nice little restaurant. The waiter, the waiter's wearing a mask. It's all nice and everybody's drinking their drinks. And uh, Sean Spears asks for his drink and, you know, the guy was a little tardy in getting his drink. Meanwhile, MJF says that Jericho has a third grade sense of humor and hope he laughs himself silly because the, it, the pinnacle is going to have the last laugh in the end. And then Dax comes in and Dax just starts kicking that reel. He's talking about, man, the pinnacle. We, this is a fine assemblage of talent. We should be chasing championships. We should be ruling AEW. We can't because we got to deal with you guys and Every 30 years in the business, Chris Jericho, you still mocking the business. And while he's cutting this super serious promo, this brain dead Goomba, Sean Spears, decides to snatch up waiter and slam his head into the table. And then was going to hit the guy in the head with a bottle for being a little too slow with his drink. And he was just breathing like a Doberman. <sighs> Like what in the, what is, what even is this character? What is this personality? What is this persona? What is this image? What is this? What is this? What am I looking at? <laughs> what am I looking at? Anyway, the, the boys all look at him like he's, you know, off his rocker, like he's off his meds, which he obviously is. And, um, he let the guy go. And then Tully tossed the guy some money and said, that ought to cover it. You know, there, there it is. So MJF says this, will, this is going to be the inner circle's very last match because the pinnacle is always on top. Pinnacle is always on top. You want the pinnacle, you're always on top. So then later, the inner circle, we're going to respond, which means it took 15 minutes to say one word, right? That's, that's a WWE Chris Jericho promo. You, <laughs> it takes 15 minutes to get out one word. But this was still a very, very, very good promo from Jericho, though. So Ortiz wanted to fight. He says, absolutely. Sammy Guevara spoke with a little bit more bass in his voice this week um, and said, this is never going to end. And this is match is, you know, called the, the Inner Circle, not the Inner Circle, but the Pinnacle, some clowns, and said that they were dumbass fishes and floating around, flopping around in sheep suits, which then all of the, all of the, the peanut gallery started chanting, Dumb ass fishes. Dumb ass fishes. Dumb ass fishes. Dumb ass fishes. And I was like, you know what? Nah. Not gonna work. Not gonna that ain't that ain't gonna work, dog. That's dumb. 
That's a dumbass fish right there. That fish ain't going to swim. Anyway, uh, Jake Hager talked and was was talking, and he basically said that the, the consequences for not accepting is greater than if they had accepted. So he accepts, and then he called them bitches. Uh, well, he called them little girl bitches or something like that. That was like the word of the night, by the way. Um, and then Jericho basically cut along. He he got he meandered a little bit. Then he says that you know was was blood and guts worth it? Is it worth it? You know he says they lost a piece of their souls, buckets of blood in that cage. Was it worth it? He says that MJF, you hurt me. But it wasn't just physical. They were trying to sell the arm. It wasn't just this dislocated elbow. It was a mental image of me being shoved off the top of that cage. I can't get it out of my mind. You scared my family. You scared my children. Was it worth it? Yes. Stadium Stampede, will we fight you? Yes. Then we're going to dance all over your faces and then piss on all over your graves. So I like, the, I love the intensity from Jericho. The seriousness from Jericho. His eyes were bloodshot red. Once again, um, I don't think I've seen Jericho. Either he needs some Claritin or he needs an AA meeting. Because uh, Jericho's eyes are red all the time. And as somebody who always has red eyes because of allergies and everything, I'm not going to go straight to alcoholism. All right? I'm not going to go straight to the ganja, which most people do. Um, but Jericho, since we know he loved the bubbly, he need to, he need to fix that. Get it together, Jericho. But of course, they're baby faces. Of course, they're going to accept the challenge. What baby face has ever been challenged and then they didn't accept it? You know, that was, that's goofy. Um, they also did a thing with uh, Sammy Guevara, his cue cards. So it basically was just like the pinnacle or, or, or overconfident and, you know, blah, 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 blah. It's going to happen and we're going to win because we're not dead. And it's like, we're going to fight until the end. We're not dead. And it's like, eh, it might as well be, dog. All right. So, uh, Scorp All right. So, uh, Scorpio Sky and uh, Ethan Page. So, Scorpio Sky says basically told this meandering story about how he used to look up to Sting, and he doesn't look up to Sting anymore. He wants to put Sting down. And then uh, Ethan Page said that you know you already put Sting down. You got him in that heel hook, and I, that same night or the next week or whatever the hell it was. He threw Darby down some steps. And then he says the next week, Darby lost his TNT title. And he said, look, I don't want to take all of the credit. But, you know, I want you to blame me. You know, a little bit of it was my fault. And I'm going to take everything from you. And it says that he will be the nail in Darby Allen's coffin. Pause right here for a moment. What are they beefing about? You know, I don't know what they're beefing about. You want to kill this guy for what? You know, being a star, being bigger and better and more important than you. That's a good heel thing. You know, I don't mind that. But we've gotten to almost blood feud levels and these guys have done little to nothing. It's like Paige and Scorpio Sky are not featured on the show. They make appearances. They do run ins. They not, you know, wrestling and showing us that they're a well-oiled tag team. Or anything like that. It's just, we don't like Sting and Darby because they're big stars and we aren't. And it's kind of like, mm, maybe if you force Tony Khan to put you on TV? Um, anyway, Sting arrived. There was snow everywhere, obviously. And then Darby attacked him from behind with a skateboard, which I'm telling you, I'm never going to get used to him, somebody getting hit with a skateboard and rest. I'm never going to get used to that. Um, Scorpio Sky and Ethan Page got beat up pretty bad. Uh, Scorpio Sky was visually tapping out in the, in the Scorpio Deathlock, which does that does a lot for your pay per view and to see your guys getting you know whipped like dogs. Which is you know look, I get it. Sometimes the, the baby faces have to fight back eventually, right? But you have to know when to do it and how to do it and how much to get, right? So. Um, a better way to do this would be to all everybody's throwing everybody's throwing hands, boom, 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 boom. And of course, in every 
straight up exchange, the babyface gets an, an advantage. Sting has that great combination that he does. Everybody, if you you know what I mean. If you've seen Sting wrestle, you know that the combination I'm talking about when he eventually does the the backhand with it. If he would have like thrown some hands with Scorpio Sky and then went boom, 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 and then bumped him, and then Scorpio Sky rolled out of the ring, that would have been so much more effective than them beating these guys to pace with a skateboard and Stinger splashing them and putting them in a Scorpion Deathlock and making them tap out. It would have been like, you know, you don't really want none. You want to attack people from behind. You don't really want to fight, though. Because when it came time to throw hands, you stood it for a little bit, but you can't hang. And you get the hell out of there. That would have been better. And then, it would have probably did Sting some, you know, probably would have helped him too because he wouldn't have had to do so much. Anyway, um, Ethan Page uh, bailed outside the ring and basically watched his partner get tapped out. And then when Sting felt like letting Scorpio Sky go, he let him go. Um, then they uh, they tried to escape through the tunnels and then there was the Dark Order. And then they tried to escape through the tunnels again and there was the Dark Order again. And I'm thinking to myself, wait a minute. They aren't supposed to be there. Why are they coming out of the heel tunnel? They're not heels. And then, of course, Scorpio Sky and, and Ethan Page jumped over the barricade and went up through the crowd. And I was like, why did we need the Dark Order here? Um, is this going to be a lumberjack match or something? Because it doesn't need to be. Uh, I'm guessing if they do make it a lumberjack match, it's going to obviously be to distract from Sting's Potential limitations, maybe. But uh, this match is going to be a tag team match. It's going to be a live match, and it does not need, it does not need, uh, you know, a lumberjack. So it, it didn't need the Dark Order. I didn't see the, the the benefit of Dark Order. It didn't make any sense. Jay Cargill gets interrupted by some dweeb named Mark Sterling, who I believe is the lawyer for MJF. Um, they don't know what they're doing with Jay, so they're just going to have her keep saying the same thing over and over again. I'm my own boss. And so this guy comes in and says, oh, no, no, no. I don't want you to work for me. I want to work for you. This is Team Jade. And, and he says, like, why aren't you getting a sit down with Jim Ross? Why are you doing a stand up interview with this guy? I don't even know who that guy is. And uh, she told him not to interrupt her. And she didn't know who his, what his name was, even though she talked to him two weeks ago. And she said she sent him away. She said, get out of here and I may think about it. Jake Hargill is lost. She's lost in the sauce. All they had for her was the Shaq match. That's all they had. After the Shaq match, they didn't have anything planned for her. So now she's basically just floating around. Which is okay, I guess. You know, sometimes people get lost in the shuffle. You have a big roster. They need to be that big, but they have a big roster. Serena Deeb defeated Red Velvet. Um, Red Velvet is so cute. I, uh, man, <sighs> she's a cute girl. Uh, Deeb was pretty aggressive. This is her comeback match. There was a moonsault off the ring apron where <laughs> Red Velvet's knee there broke Serena Deeb's face. That was a pretty, pretty vicious knee drop. <laughs> Even though it was meant to be a moonsault. Uh, anyway, Deeb targeted the legs and knees or whatever. Uh, this was a very solid match. Serena Deeb doesn't have bad matches. See, she ended up submitting uh, Red Velvet by smashing her knee into the mat numerous times and then using, I think, a single leg Boston Crab to get the submission. Perfectly fine way to win the match. I'm cool with that. Pac. Pac was sick and tired of being robbed of opportunities. But now I got to the championship match at Double or Nothing. So who, what fool bets against a bastard now? And I was like, all right, whatever. Uh, speaking of that, uh, we got Kenny Omega. He went to hang out with Orange Cassidy supposedly last week after Orange Cassidy got powerbombed into oblivion. Uh, they showed him the footage of him being powerbombed into oblivion. And then Omega says, I'm not talking to you as a wrestler. I'm talking to you as the EVP. He says, we value you here as a mascot to AEW. We need you to sell t-shirts and to help you out, I want you to sign this here document that says that you are going to forego your double or nothing championship match. And you'll get a, still get a title shot. It'll just be later. But because you're injured, you will not wrestle at double or nothing. Then Orange Cassidy tore this document in the slowest 
most dramatic way. Just rip. And of course they ignore <laughs> He He's ignoring them. He's not responding. So then they said, well, we're going to, we're going to explain this to you one more time. And he says like, look, that's what a power bomb did. What, what, what went wrong with that power bomb? Nothing. It, it goes how power bombs go. But what happens if I hit you with the one winged angel? You could be crippled. You could be injured. You could be killed. And then they said, we're going to leave you with this document one more time. And then let us know and file it back to us later. Um, so here's the thing. Now, and this is going to sound strange, but we could have. What, why wouldn't Orange Cassidy be OK with that? I'm, I know they're heels. You can't take them seriously. But why risk a fighting two guys when you can wrestle the champion one on one? I don't know. If you have a guaranteed title shot anyway. I would rather it be one-on-one, -on -one. wouldn't you? Your chances of winning increase dramatically, you know? And I get they were offending him, calling him the mascot, saying, oh, he's good for selling t-shirts. I get that. But I'm saying, like, that's emotional, you know? I would rather fight two guys than fight one. I'd be like, mm, no. I would like for, you know, obviously Orange Cassidy is not going to contend with that idea, not even think, you know, concern himself with it. I would advise for somebody to think about it. Like, wouldn't it be easier for you to fight one, the champion one on one, to take it to a lawyer and say, "Yeah, I want uh, my one on one match on this episode of Dynamite, and one on one me versus the champion. Much better. I can wait a couple of weeks to be the champion. I can wait a few weeks. Versus having to beat two guys. Yeah, not a problem. That's just me though." So we get Anthony Agogo versus Austin Gunn. So now uh, on promo, there was a promo on uh, online. It was an online promo about Anthony Agogo, and he was calling himself the governor. But I actually liked this promo. He was very confident. He was very clear. He respects Austin Gunn for wanting revenge to protect his daddy, and he said, but he expected it to be Colton, his bigger, better looking, more athletic brother. He says, I know simply. You want to be like your daddy. I will make you like your daddy. And he said, I'm the governor. <laughs> the governor of AEW. I didn't do a good job on this promo, but it was actually pretty good. You probably saw it on Twitter. It was, I actually enjoyed it. So um, I noticed that uh, uh, Anthony Agogo had the Olympic rings on his tights. I'm pretty sure he, they're going to get slapped with a lawsuit because um, the Olympic committee or whatever the hell. They own that image to the rings. I'm guessing, you know, as long as they go under the radar, you know, it's okay. But eventually they're going to see that. And because the, the, the Olympics are really anal about IP. They really are. Um, uh, there was, I think there was something that involved Kurt Angle. Like, didn't they have him stop doing something um, because they didn't want him using the word Olympic? I think it was the Olympic slam, wasn't it? That's why they changed it to the Angle slam because uh, the Olympics didn't want, you know, anybody to concern themselves with that crap. It's, it's really weird, whatever. But Austin Gunn got body punched twice. You know, most everybody else got hit once and that was pretty much it. He got hit twice. And then we got blood gushing from Austin Gunn's mouth because, you know, and they tried to show this, this young scrappy warrior who wants to fight. Ooh, I hit right in the gut again. Oh no, what am I supposed to do? I got hit in the gut. And Cody's out there draped in the American flag. Like it's like Rocky 3. <laughs> you know? He's going to kill your rock. He's going to kill your dead. He's going to murder you. He's going to murder your rock. <laughs> and then this blood, quote unquote, ends up on Anthony Gogo's face. And, you know, Anthony Gogo does a pop-up punch, which is weak. It's so weak. And the referee stopped the match. Gogo then grabs the American flag from the ring post. And uh, Cody, and he, he looked like he was going to wipe the blood from his face on it, which would have been ill. That that would have been ill. He probably would have got some real heat. He probably would have done it. He probably he looked like he might have chickened out. I think that uh, if it was somebody like Brock or somebody like that, he would have done it. If it was Shawn Michaels, he'd have put it up his nose. You know, you got to stop being scared of offending people. You're already doing this stupid angle that got nothing to do with either country because countries aren't arguing or at war or anything like that. 
You know, ain't been at war with Britain in 200 fucking years. But if you're going to go there, go there. I would have wiped the fucking blood with the flag. And then, you know, if you had to apologize for it, do it later. Whatever. Anyway, he threw the flag at Cody. And it was like he threw Cody's baby at Cody. He's like, my flag! My flag! Get my flag back! How dare you! How dare you! Uh, okay. So then we got Britt Baker accompanying Rebel to the ring to wrestle Hikaru Shida. Um... Which made no sense. Rebel, for starters, doesn't really wrestle. This wasn't much of a match. Rebel faked having a knee injury. And we know it didn't work. She basically kicked her ass and then tapped her out with a stretch muffler. Then, of course, uh, Baker attacked Sheeta from behind and stomped on her with the title. You know, did the foot stomp with the belt. Uh, this is where the clock is ticking on, uh, on that title run, dog. It's been long enough. It's over. It's about over. So then we get SCU. SCU comes out there. Um, Christopher Daniels was asked about his future. He shook uh, Kaz's hand and whispered something to him. Then Kazarian got real serious. And he says that Christopher Daniels meant a lot to him. And that whatever path that man chooses, he deserves it because he's been in the business for all this time. Then he says he lost something important, not just a partner, but he lost a piece of himself. And he blames the elite for it. And says that they're going to learn about loss. And that he's a bomb they can't defuse. And a gun they can't unload. And he's going to get him a piece of the elite. And I said. If. Uh, if Kazarian was 10 years younger. He would be a threat. But there's no way. There's no way. The first thing he's probably going to do. Is get tangled up with. you know Brandon Cutler and Michael Nakazawa. There ain't no serious stuff coming out of this man. Ain't nothing serious coming out of this breakup of SCU. Um, I definitely think that Christopher Daniels should retire, though. I, you know, that's just me. You know, he ain't got nothing left to he ain't got nothing left to prove. Um, they need the roster space. The guy shouldn't doesn't need to wrestle anymore. You know, let the young boys take over. Kaz is a, is only slightly younger, but you know, uh, they obviously not gonna have Kaz versus Omega for the title in the main event or something. Well, they maybe for a main event of like Dynamite or something, maybe. But then, uh. Uh, I'm interested. So let's see what they do. Even though I think it's going to be all of watch elevation, watch dark. I'm not watching that shit. So then we get Miro, Miro and Lance Archer. We're going to close our review with this. Miro thanked Jesus for his protection and for granting him strength. <laughs> My boy, Jesus. Then he says that he took from Darby what Darby said could never be taken. Then he says, I've proved it. If you have what I want, it's done. And it says next week somebody's going to get a shot. And it ends up being some guy named Dante Martin, one of the top flight kids. So then Lance Archer came out there and says that he's been the beast of AEW since you were trying to have a quote unquote day to yourself. And he says this is going to be Godzilla versus Kong. He's going to make him his Bulgarian bitch. So we got little schoolgirl bitches, Bulgarian bitches. How many more bitches we got on the roster? You know? I think we need to stop using bitch as like the only emphasis that we can put on something. We got to find another way of offending people. And then Miro comes out with something that was actually pretty good. Because he said that, you know, you call yourself a beast. You call yourself a mur murder hawk monster. But every week you come out here and the old man holds you back. Nobody holds me back. And there's not enough yoga in the world to save Jake Roberts. <laughs> if he gets near me. And <laughs> this version of Miro is so much better than video game Miro. Uh, this is champion uh, going to go in there. Act a fool Miro. Okay. So Miro versus Lance Archer for the TNT belt. <clears throat> um, I wonder if they're going to rename the title when it moved to TBS or they're just going to make the TNT title, the title for rampage, which, you know, is an easy way of handling that problem. But, um, I like the match. I like the uh, the Lance Archer Miro match. It's a good challenge for Miro. Uh, it doesn't do Lance Archer any favors because he's not going to win, but it's a good challenge for Miro, <clears throat> who need good challengers. So this all going to work out very well. Uh, that was AEW Dynamite. Uh, it was once again a weak episode of AEW Dynamite. They have <laughs> there isn't much to like if we're being honest. I, I kind of like the pairing of Kingston and Moxie. I just don't like what they're doing with them. 
uh, the champions. I like the Miro and uh, Lance Archer stuff. It's not bad. Um, hopefully, it, it maintains a serious tone. Um, and these two guys are giving some opportunities to go out there and make a name for themselves. And ought to be uh, pretty decent. You know, ought to be pretty decent fight slug fest between two giant guys. That ought to be fun. Everybody loves a good horse fight. You know, people don't. People say that they don't, but they do. So hopefully it's going to be a good horse fight. It ought to be very different from everything else that's going to be on that card. All right. So like this video, share this video, subscribe to the channel. Thank you guys for your support and um, c continue to do so. And I shall talk to you guys later, man. Peace out.